Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A, a history of science and technology Q&A. Um, so we had a bunch of questions saved up from last time. Uh, there's a question here from Mayday. Is there some particular scientific discovery that was forgotten and later rediscovered by someone else whose importance I would have liked to be recognized the first time? Oh boy. The history of science is just littered with these things. Um, a couple of different things that happen. I think the main story is things get discovered, but they don't have quite enough context for them to become widely understood and for them to kind of uh, uh, spread out and get known to everybody, get, get part of it. it. It's kind of like a, it's like some kind of blockchain of knowledge or something. The, do the things achieve something to the point where they get included in this kind of giant blockchain or ledger of, of, of the building up of knowledge? Or are they things which were sort of dropped off and people didn't recognize? And um, there are just so many examples. There are many examples from my own life. There are many examples from the history of science. Um, let's, let's see. Well, let me talk about one of them, a particular dramatic one, the Antikythera device from, uh, oh, probably around 2,000 years ago now. Um, this is this mechanical computer that was an astronomical computation device at uh, about you know, a few inches across, um, made of a bunch of sort of fairly precise cogs and gears and so on, intended to kind of reproduce the motion of, of planets and so on, and to be able to, to give some prediction of eclipses, things like that. This was a device that was produced in antiquity. We know nothing about about how it was produced, where it came from, uh, what was going on with it. All we know is it's in the shipwreck off this island off the coast of Greece. It was originally the lump of corroded stuff was discovered 100 years ago. Uh, it was at some point dropped and people realized, oh my gosh, this lump of corroded stuff has these cogs and gears sticking out of it. And there was a big effort over the course of many years, even with very recent uh, kind of uh, uh, progress to decode what this thing actually is and using CT scanning to look inside the, the lump of corroded stuff and, and all this kind of thing um, to try to figure out what it was. But the answer is what it was, was a mechanical computer the likes of which were not seen again until the 1600s. So there was a period of about 1600 years where, where this was lost. And the technology, it, it wasn't the case that the Antikythera device, uh, it's named after the island that the, the shipwreck was found near. Um, it, it wasn't the case that this was a unique one-off thing where, where somebody uh, just sort of came up with this, this unique thing and that was the only one and, and we happened to have found it. Um, no, I think... There, the, the, there must have been a substantial period of development that led to the kind of fairly elaborate structure that existed in this particular device, probably 50 years, 100 years, maybe more than that, of development of these kinds of devices. And yet, we just happened to have this one from this one shipwreck, and nothing like it showed up again until the 1600s. Had it showed up, people's understanding, I think, of the role of computation as a foundation for understanding the world would have been very different. Um, had it been something where people routinely expected to automate the sort of the process of computation, the history of science would have been different. What, what do I mean by that? In people, this idea that you can set up the, the rules for the structure of something, and then the thing will somehow work out the consequences of those rules automatically, that's not a thing that we generally know. That's not a thing we, we, with computers now, we're very used to that idea. We write a program, then the computer just on its own autonomously runs the program and something happens, we can see the results. And we can get this, uh, something I've spent a lot of my life doing, 
is getting intuition about sort of the computational universe of programs and what kinds of things can happen when you just set up rules and sort of autonomously let them run. But most of the time, that's that's really not the kind of thing people have thought about. And the fact that if there had been sort of computers much earlier in history, I'm sure that that would have been a thing that would have come up. People would have said, well, we just take this sort of random collection of gearings and so on, and we say, what does it do? And uh, uh, and that would get, lead one down this path of saying, what do sort of arbitrarily chosen rules end up doing? And that would have ended up with a bunch of discoveries that I ended up having the chance to make and so on. So, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so the, 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 that's an example. So the mechanical computers from antiquity just disappeared, didn't reappear again until the 1600s. I would say that that, that was one where things just didn't sort of catch fire. There weren't enough of these things around that the tradition of them got, got preserved. Um, I think that um, uh, there are many other examples of discoveries where they were not made because there wasn't the context to understand what one was seeing. So for example, a lot of discoveries I've made have to do with studying this sort of computational universe of possible programs and um, uh, understanding their consequences and realizing that even when the program is simple, the behavior it produces may be very complicated. And the question is, why weren't things like that seen before? It's a very generic, very robust phenomenon. Why weren't they seen before? And I went back and looked for this and found out that, well, yes, there were plenty of examples of things like that that were seen. They just didn't have a context to be understood. So for example, the digits of pi, the randomness of the digits of pi has been known for a while, for at least 200 years. It's been known that the sequence of digits of pi, 3.14159, et cetera, for all practical purposes looks quite random. And yet there's definitely a, a definite rule fairly simple rule that specifies how you generate those digits, yet once generated, they seem random. For example, John Venn of Venn Diagram fame had a book in the early 1800s, I think, in which he actually plots out a random walk made from the digits of pi, showing it sort of randomly going around wherever. And it's like, isn't that interesting? Well, people tried to prove things about, oh, there are an equal number of ones and zeros and so on in the digits of pi. Nothing like that has ever been proved. But so, there wasn't, but, but people tried to, they said, well, yes, it's random, but we don't really understand what the significance of that is, but let's at least try and prove something regular about the randomness, like there are an equal number of zeros and ones. And so there wasn't really a context for understanding, so what, that the digits of pi are random? What consequence does that have? How do we build that into some kind of coherent narrative, coherent framework? And, and the same kind of phenomenon about sort of randomness being discovered, like the primes, Primes were known in antiquity. Pythagoras knew about primes for fifth century BC. Um, Plato talks about primes. It's um, uh, primes were were a known thing, and people had uh, people knew about factors of numbers at least up to the few thousands and so on. Um, and the fact that the sequence of primes looks in some ways quite random, nobody really locked into that that idea. It was just like okay, it's hard to compute primes. It's just hard to compute primes. There's no significance to the fact that these primes have a sequence that looks kind of random. So the same thing showed up just over and over again. I mean, like, like for instance, um, in early simulations of neural nets back in the 1950s, people discovered that in this, you know, even though they had definite, uh, they sometimes they were analog, but often they were digital simulations of these things, they would set them up, they would keep them running, and sometimes they would do kind of random things. And people said, well, that's just kind of a nuisance. We don't want that. We want our pattern recognition neural net to just recognize the pattern. We don't want it to be flapping around doing random things. So those kinds of, the, the, that discovery that a simply set up program, whether it's for primes, whether it's for pi, whether it's for the early neural nets, whether it's for the 3n plus one problem and number theory, whatever, all these different cases where there are sort of simple rules, complicated behavior, it's like there wasn't a big thing made out of that. And, you know, it came, I suppose, to me, I'm, 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 I think the, the question that was asked was, are there things that I would have liked it if they'd been discovered earlier? 
uh, in a sense, it was fun for me that they weren't discovered earlier because then I got a chance to discover all this stuff and to realize that there was a much bigger picture that could be wrapped around all of these different examples of, of simple rules producing complicated or seemingly random behavior. And that's what led to my whole effort, a new kind of science and the sort of the development of this new kind of science in which the raw material is to look at these kind of abstract systems in the computational universe and see what they do. And a core phenomenon is then this phenomenon that precursors of which have been observed for hundreds of years or longer um, of, uh, of this complicated behavior from simple underlying rules, but just hadn't been put together in a kind of intellectual uh, uh, collection. You know, I would say in my own life, there have been plenty of times when there are things that they should have been discovered earlier. And I just didn't get it. I didn't understand it. Uh, even when I was studying uh, these simple programs in the computational universe, one of my all-time favorites, Rule 30, um, uh, it's a cellular automaton with just a line of black and white cells and rules that just say how to determine the color of a cell based on the color of cells immediately adjacent to it above on the, on the, on the piece of paper or whatever. Well, on the screen, I should say, these days. Well, you know, I first generated Rule 30 evolution back in, what was it, 1980, maybe? Uh, yeah, I think around 1980, maybe 1981. Um, but for various reasons, the great significance of that, of that evolution is there's this pattern where very simple rule, you started off in a very simple way, yet the thing it generates is in, in many respects completely random. Well, I first generated that probably in 1981, let's say, um, and I just sort of ignored the fact that it was possible. I kind of had arguments, oh, nothing like that's going to be possible. I didn't really look at it in detail. Um, I looked at other kinds of things with random initial conditions and what kind of behavior can be generated, and I came up with lots of interesting conclusions from that, but I didn't pay attention. I, I generated, I have a printout of Rule 30, uh, but I didn't pay attention to it. Then finally, I think it was 1984, I had a new laser printer. Uh, laser printers were, were young and rare at that time. And I decided I'd, I'm gonna use this laser printer to print this really cool picture of all these different cellular automata. And I thought, well, why don't I generate this rule 31 at very high resolution, just see what it looks like. And it's like, wow, this looks really complicated. What on earth is going on here? And then I started to realize there's a real phenomenon here, but I'd had to do all this buildup of all these other things that I'd looked at before I was really ready, before I was really primed to realize, gosh, there's this actual phenomenon going on here and it's a very powerful phenomenon. And I've spent decades after that time, uh, you know, exploring that phenomenon and realizing that rule 30 is just the tip of this giant iceberg of all these different places where this phenomenon occurs. I mean, I, I view it as being my, uh, well, perhaps very junior, example of a sort of the Galileo 1608 moment, so to speak. You know, in 1608, uh, Galileo had uh, sort of uh, improved this sort of telescope discovery that, that um, uh, he'd, he'd heard about and had managed to make a reasonable astronomical telescope. Um, the, 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 the myth, I don't know how true the statement is, is that Galileo being ever the kind of the, the oper operator of some kind um, had licensed the use of the telescope for terrestrial purposes to the merchants of Venice, so to speak, um, to uh, so that uh, you know somebody could get information faster than everybody else by running up that tower in the middle of Venice, looking out on the horizon to see whose ships were coming in and whose ships were lost, and and going and trading in the market based on uh, based on that early information, so to speak, that he'd licensed the telescope for all its terrestrial uses to those folk. But that didn't say anything about non-terrestrial uses. And so that's why he went up to the roof of his, uh, his building and um, uh, you know, turned the telescope to the sky and discovered the moons of Jupiter. Well, you know, what was surprising about the moons of Jupiter at that time was just you know, that was something one didn't expect to see there. One didn't expect to see what Galileo, I think, rather quickly interpreted as something like a little solar system. I don't know how long it took him to figure out that's what he was seeing. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, his, his book, Sidereus Nuncius, the, um, 
the the starry messenger, so to speak, messenger of the stars or whatever, um, was uh, <clears throat> certainly has a discovery story about that. I don't know how um, uh, how many you know. I don't know whether Galileo saw those little dots of light um, near Jupiter and said, "Gosh, those are like." like the planets orbiting the sun or whether it took him, you know, how many days, weeks or whatever it took him. It didn't take him that long to figure out what was going on there. But um, in the case of looking at the sort of computational universe, the big surprise is you see something very unexpected. You see that these simple rules produce very complicated behavior, but to understand that you need a, a, a fa you need kind of a conceptual framework. I suppose for Galileo, he had Copernicus as his conceptual framework of, this is, uh, you know, you can think about planets going around a, a central thing, and this is, and that's sort of the priming that Galileo used to understand what he was seeing um, in his telescope. And, uh, you know, he, he, he saw other kinds of things, like he saw features of the moon, he saw, you know, mountains on the moon and so on. And um, I think in that case, his sort of interpretation of what's going on in mountains on the moon I'm not sure about him, but certainly other people were like, well, it must just be a, a you know, a landscape just like on Earth. And there's there's rain and there's and there's rivers and there's all kinds of things. Of course, the truth of it is that the, the mountains on the moon have a, well, related but not quite the same origin as the topography of the Earth, so to speak, because there isn't an atmosphere on the moon. So in any case, I, I think, you know, a, a common feature is... Do you have the framework? Do you have the thing that you need to understand what you see? And, and I think there are uh, sometimes there are discoveries, or quite often there are discoveries, experiments that get done where it's like, there's this experiment and it shows something unexpected. I think the, the thing one should be impressed by uh, among experimental scientists is when an experimental scientist can deliver something where they say, look, I saw this in an experiment and nobody expected this. And, and it's right and you have to pay attention to it. That is not the most common thing. The most common thing is very incremental kind of, well, it could be this or it could be that. Let's do the experiment, find out which it is. Or there's a theory that predicts this. Let's go verify that and so on. The case that really is impressive is when it's like, look, there's this thing happening. We didn't expect this at all, but it's right. And we can try to understand what's going on. And I think, um, uh, so to, you know, in the point of view of, of experimental science, that's the kind of thing one, one looks for. And I think there are plenty of examples of where there have been uh, discoveries made where they were not recognized for a long time afterwards, just because uh, maybe the experimentalist wasn't believed, maybe it wasn't trusted. I, I know, for example, in particle physics, uh, when I was first getting into particle physics around 1974, the big thing that was being just talked about was the, the rise of the electron positron total annihilation cross section. Well, it had been observed. That rise had been observed several years earlier. It was just like, well, I don't know, it's this Italian accelerator, and we're not sure if it's giving the right answer. And oh, they, you know, and, and they weren't that sure either, and so on and so on and so on. And then eventually it was sort of enough places, well, a couple of places actually, saw this and it was sort of a robust enough experiment that yes, this is real, we have to pay attention to it. But uh, you know, right now, there's uh, sort of a, a experimental result on the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon, where people are like, oh, that's not expected. You know, what is the significance of that? Um, I'm not sure yet. Um, whether it's even, you know, whether the experiments are really right, whether the predictions are really right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, uh, you know, I think that's a, that's a case where where things get interesting is when you see something very unexpected, and you really pay attention to it, um, and the experiment is correct, so to speak. Uh, you know, there have been so many examples in in biomedicine, for example, so many examples of where people have observed things, and um, uh, you know, just they weren't believed for one reason or another. And then it turned out to be true. I mean, I suppose one that I, I don't know all the history of is the is the stomach ulcers uh, disaster, where people for a long time believed, you know, certainly until fairly recent years, that was some, um, uh, you know, uh, you are in too stressful a job. That's why you're getting stomach ulcers. But people had known for a while that there were theories that well, it was just an infection. 
And turns out that was correct. But for a long time, the, the force of, of belief was in one direction that, that caused that not to be the way that, um, uh, the way that it was concluded. And I, I, I suspect with this pandemic that uh, uh, we still remain in, in some sense, although it's, it's waning, I think, um, the, uh, there are quite a few cases where people come up with things where, where there's sort of a, a some kind of uh, you know experimental result. What's its significance? Do we really take it seriously? Do we not take it seriously? You know the remarkable coincidence of infection curves in places that did lockdowns and didn't do lockdowns. How can that possibly be? Um, is that something significant? Is that an experimental finding that we should pay attention to that is telling us something, or is that just a coincidence of uh, well curves all go up and go down, and so it sort of has to be that way. Um, these are things where, you know, the force of belief in an experimental result and whether one takes that and decides to, to build a theory around it is an important thing. I mean, I suppose in my own life, another place where this has happened is more on the theoretical side of trying to understand how to build a fundamental theory of physics. And the, the theory that we have now uh, is based on sort of very abstract structures that turn out to be extremely similar to the abstract structures that I've used in computational language design for 40 years now. But I didn't recognize the fact that those structures might be applicable in this, I, although I'd explored those structures a lot, might be applicable to fundamental physics. It took going through some very circuitous route involving other kinds of intermediate stages to get to that point. I mean, I, I would say the other thing that can happen which I think is going to happen with a bunch of things we're discovering from the formalism of our physics project is, okay, let's say we make progress in, let's say, economics. Um, what will end up happening is that progress, if it gets made, will be made by sort of going one step at a time from the intuition from a formalism to physics to intuition from physics to sort of applying that in another place. And in the end, you'll be able to say, actually, you know, all that stuff in the middle about physics, it's all irrelevant. We could just go straight from this kind of formal idea to its application in economics without going through all the stuff in the middle. But you need that stuff in the middle as a practical way for, for sort of us practical human scientists, so to speak, uh, to be able to figure out what's going on. All right, that was a bit of a long answer. There, there are many things like that to talk about. Okay, let's see. Uh, um, all right, there's a question here. How did the theory of computational complexity emerge? And is there research in that field that I find particularly promising? All right, what is computational complexity theory? It's very confusing because I developed this field that's called, that I called complex systems research, but other people called complexity theory. That's kind of the theory of systems where you have, for example, simple underlying components, but complicated overall behavior. I kind of developed that uh, with other people who were involved also in the 1980s. And I avoided calling that field complexity theory in order to avoid the pre-existing theory of computational complexity theory, which was about something completely different. But other people sort of started using a name for my kind of field that was complexity theory, thereby utterly confusing lots of things. But let me talk about computational complexity theory. Different question from um, uh, complexity theory, although in the end, there might be, in the not too distant future, an amazing convergence of those two sets of ideas. But the fact that their names are, are similar is not the reason for that convergence. Okay, computational complexity theory. Okay, the question is, how hard is it to do a computation? Let's say you're adding numbers together. And let's say you've got n-digit numbers to add up, two n-digit numbers. You, you line up the numbers, you do long addition. It takes you, the number of steps it takes you is oh, well, roughly n steps. You just got to you know, do each digit and you know, add them up. And maybe there's a carry and you have, to, you have to take account of that. And that can add a little bit more, but it's roughly n steps. Okay, let's look at multiplication. Uh, and, and you know, I'm pretty bad at doing this by hand, but with long multiplication, you write out these two numbers and you build up this whole sort of array of intermediate numbers. 
And if the numbers are each of length n, the, the amount of time necessary to the, the number of steps necessary to do the multiplication by the standard kind of uh, school method of doing multiplication will be about n squared. And so what one says is that that's a problem where the sort of computational complexity of solving that problem is of order n squared. For n digit numbers, it takes about n squared um, uh, steps to, to do the computation. Okay, so the question arose, given these different kinds of computations, particularly as you made them bigger, how much more difficult would they be to, to, to do? So for example, a very famous one is factoring numbers. If you have an n digit number, that means the number is, let's say it's binary digits, that means the number is up to size two to the n. And then the question is, how do you find the factors of that number? Well, you can find the factors. One way to find the factors, you just try dividing it by numbers less than its square root, but they're of order two to the n of those numbers, to, you know, two to the n over two of those numbers. So in a sense, even though it was an n digit number, it's taking about two to the n steps to do that factoring operation. And that's kind of a critical uh, belief, at least that's made use of in public key cryptography and the whole infrastructure of the world now depends on that fact that it sort of takes two to the n-ish steps to do factoring, even though multiplying the numbers together takes, takes a time of order of order n or n squared. Well, okay, so this question of how difficult is it to do these computations? How, how fast can you really multiply numbers together? So in the 1950s, people started sort of, as, as computers started to get more streamlined, and people started to think about algorithms for doing computing, people started to wonder about those questions. How difficult is it really to do stuff? So uh, an example, sorting things. If you have n things to sort, how do you sort them? Well, you, you've got them all in line and you can just say, let me compare each two that I see next to each other. If they're in order, leave them the way they are. If they're out of order, flip them around. That's a particular strategy for sorting. The question is, that's an n squared sorting algorithm with n objects, it takes n squared comparisons on, on average to sort the list. How, how fast can you sort? So um, in the 1960s, I think early 1960s, for example, uh, a chap called Tony Hoare invented a thing called uh, quicksort, uh, which is a, a kind of a weird recursive algorithm for sorting things where you sort of break break the sequence in two and you sort each subsequence and then you combine them together. Um, it's a sort of recursive tree-like algorithm and it sorts in about n log n time. So that was an early kind of surprise algorithm where things worked faster than you would expect. Even for multiplication, you might say, well, it takes n squared steps. Well, it doesn't actually, because a lot of the things you're doing are repeats of things you've done before. And so pretty quickly, it was discovered how to do it in, a, I think, n to the 1.58 up uh, steps, and then gradually it was discovered how to do it in uh, about n log n or n log log n uh, steps. But that was those things were discovered in the 1960s. There was a lot of work done. There's a lot of Soviet work done on these kinds of things. I suppose one could one could imagine that well, computers were harder to make there, so it took it was worth spending the human effort to try and optimize the algorithms. Um, a thing that happened um, was, uh, uh, but that wasn't yet a coherent field of kind of exploring sort of the complexity in quotes in, in the sense of this difficulty of doing algorithms. It was just a, a one-off thing. And, and in the 1960s, a lot of work got done on linear algebra or matrix computations, all these different algorithms about these different kinds of decomposition and so on, all these different progressively more algorithms got discovered for that where people worried about how fast is this algorithm and would it be an n log n algorithm or an n squared algorithm? What kind of thing would it be? Okay, so then the question was, it was sort of a, a thing noticed that there were these classes of algorithms. There were these things where uh, if you could do one of them, well, you, it was sort of like doing another one and they were sort of things that came together. One, one class of, of cases were things like the factoring problem where you've got a number, and you say, work out its prime factors. Well, that's hard to do. It might take exponential time, two to the n steps, two to the n computations to do that. But multiplying those numbers together to check that they are indeed the factors of that number, that's very fast. So this idea that there might be computations which are, if you could guess the answer, if you somehow got the answer, they're very fast to check. 
but it may be hard to systematically get the answer. That class of questions, people sort of started recognizing in the 1960s that there were a bunch of, of questions that were like that. And that related to the idea of non-deterministic Turing machines, uh, Turing machines where there are many possible uh, sort of computations that the Turing machine could do. And you say, you're a winner if there exists a possible computer, a possible path of computation that gets you to the answer, even if there are others that go off and do crazy things. So non-deterministic Turing machines, uh, they were kind of, um, uh, in the 1950s, those started to be investigated and it started to be, there started to be results on whether a non-deterministic Turing machine could do more than an ordinary Turing machine. It can't because you can always just enumerate, although it might take exponentially many steps, the non-deterministic Turing machines, different paths and so on. There were results about tilings, whether you could uh, you know, tile the plane with tiles of a certain form that was shown to be equivalent to the halting problem for non-deterministic Turing machines by Hao Wang. That must have been in the around uh, late 1950s, early 1960s. But um, uh, actually Kurt Gödel, um, has some letter somewhere where he talks about this phenomenon of this kind of um, uh, things that can be checked quickly, but are hard to systematically find out like this factoring problem. Okay, so the big setup then was uh, what, in, uh, going towards the end of the 1960s, um, the, the kind of the, the classification of these different kinds of problems. So a big class of problems which became called the class of P problems, polynomial time problems, were ones where as you make the size of the problem instance bigger, the N bigger, the amount of computational work, the amount of the number of computational steps increases like a polynomial in N. So it might be N squared, it might be N cubed, it might be N to the 1.5, but it's a polynomial in N, as opposed to an exponential, a two to the N, you know, more rapid increase. So, so it sort of became the case in the 1960s that, that um, there was a um, uh, the sort of class of problems that were polynomial time. And then there were the class of problems that were NP, non-deterministic polynomial time. If you could get the answer somehow by guessing it or some other way, then you could uh, then you could uh, then you could check the answer in polynomial time. Okay, so then the thing that happened in 1970s, Stephen Cook um, uh, developed this idea of NP completeness. So that idea, so, so the, the thing was, there were these problems that were NP problems. There were a bunch that were known. There were problems like uh, factoring. There were problems like uh, satisfiability, given a Boolean expression, uh, you know, P or Q and not R and uh, uh, P, whatever. Given that Boolean expression, are there assignments of true, false, truth values to P, Q, et cetera, such that that expression can be true. Another example of an NP problem. Once you've got such an assignment of truth values, it's very fast to check whether in fact the expression is true, but to find out whether there is such an assignment of truth values, in principle, you might have to try all two to the N possibilities. There were uh, various kinds of graph matching problems. There were problems in, in parsing. There were problems in all kinds of different combinatorial problems, which seem to be in this class NP. And, and nobody knew how to do any of them quickly. Nobody knew how to do any of them polynomial time. So what Stephen Cook realized is that there's a notion of NP completeness. That is that in a sense, there are problems in the class NP, which have the property that any other problem in the class NP can be encoded in polynomial time in terms of that problem. So it's like universal computers. You know, universal computers, you know, understood in the Turing machine times and, and so on in 1936. By the way, we talked earlier about, about discoveries that were not made, that could have been made earlier. The very idea of universal computation could easily have been made earlier than 1936. And it had precursors in Gödel's theorem, it had precursors in combinators from 1920, it had precursors in Leibniz's work in the 1600s, but it wasn't made until there was the sort of, you know, in, in, until the framework existed and there's a sort of critical mass of, of, of things that came together. But in any case, the, um, the, the idea of universal computers is there can be a fixed universal computer, a fixed universal Turing machine, where just by changing its programming, it can do any computation you want. Well, 
that's true for computations. What, what Stephen Cook looked at in NP problems is this idea of NP completeness where you can have one NP problem that has the property that by setting it up appropriately with an appropriate instance of that NP problem, you can encode any other NP problem. So for example, satisfiability was, was I think the first one where that was established where you could show that satisfiability could encode these graph matching problems. It could encode other kinds of things. You could use it like a junior version of a universal computer uh, junior in the sense that it could encode all these other NP problems and it could do it where the encoding needed was a polynomial time encoding. Okay, so that was this idea of NP completeness. And, and that was a powerful idea because that meant that if you had NP completeness, then if you could show that satisfiability could be done in polynomial time, then every other NP problem could also be done in polynomial time. So it, it, it means that there are the, the sort of hardest problems, the the, um, the sort of the maximally difficult problems in the, in the class NP are these NP complete problems, and there are many of them. My principle of computational equivalence kind of suggests that there will be, they'll be quite ubiquitous in the space of NP problems, but that's a, that's a different issue. But, um, okay, so anyway, in 1970, this idea of NP completeness arose. Uh, people, uh, there was a famous book by Gary and Johnson that was sort of a, a catalog of, uh, of NP complete problems that kind of just showed how broad this idea of NP completeness was because so many different popular problems all turned out to be NP complete. Well, then there developed other forms of computational complexity. So you can say, well, NP completeness is about the amount of time it takes. There's also the notion of P space, how much memory. Do you need a polynomially increasing amount of memory to do this? There were, for a while, the main computational complexity classes were P and NP and P space. Then as people started to think about parallel computation, this is now more in the, uh, probably in the 19, uh, what was that, 19, late, mid to late 1980s, people started talking about um, uh, classes of computational complexity classes that involved doing things on parallel computers. Um, where you could have many computers running in parallel and you say, how long does it take? How many computers does it need? And so on. And eventually there became this whole zoo of different computational complexity classes. And one started to know things like, is, is P strictly a subset of NP or does P equal NP? And that's, that's a sort of famous problem of, is there in fact a polynomial time way to do, uh, uh, to, to do these problems? Um, so that, uh, it, for a while, people were like P versus NP. That's, you know, a key problem. That's something that um, uh, we really, you know, it, it's, it's really a defining problem of, of computation. And, and in, uh, you know, the question then is, when you have a problem that is NP complete, does that mean that if, you, if, if suddenly something you're studying is NP complete, does that mean game over, you're toast? You'll never be able to do it. It's going to take too long. Well, not in practice, because many MP problems, even MP complete problems, have the feature that there are approximate solutions that are very good that can be found quite quickly. And it's only just there's maybe one really, really good solution, but it's better than all the others. And there's this question of sort of what's the distribution? Is it a, is it a thing where the best solutions are over here in this tail, uh, you know, a, a sort of a, a separate little, little colony far away from the tail? Or is there sort of a continuous variation where if you do reasonably well, you can get into the tail. And so there were methods like simulated annealing. Uh, so it's so a one place where NP complete problems show up quite often is in circuit layout, where you're asking, is there a way of laying out all these components so that you minimize the wire length or something like this? Um, and, uh, and then the question was, you could, as you try to do that, you very quickly, uh, if you say, well, I'm going to take this, this configuration, I'm gonna just gradually tweak it. I'm gonna kind of evolve it gradually to something where it is correct. Well, you might get stuck. You might have a configuration where there's no way by incremental changes to get it to the best solution. There's something that happens in many systems, this sort of idea of sort of local minima it happens a lot in machine learning and things like that, where, where you kind of get stuck. This incremental process, um, uh, gets gets kind of stuck and you have to kind of um, 
uh, be be much wilder in your thinking, so to speak. It, it's kind of like the way people think about things. You know, you can end up in a very definite path and you don't figure things out, but you have to have something from way out, you know, the sort of lateral thinking from, from somewhere completely different that comes in and, and shows you the answer. So there was a method, uh, I think Scott Patrick was the main person involved in this, who developed um, at IBM in the 1970s, developed this method called simulated annealing, so in annealing in a metal, for example, you're trying to get a nice crystalline metal. Um, you you know the, the the grains of the metal might have all lined up in a particular direction, but they may be in multiple different grains of the metal. You can anneal it. You can heat it up again, and then cool it down again. And as you as you do that, you're 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 unfreezing the the kind of configuration, and you're letting it sort of refreeze again. And so so similar to annealing was a method that was developed to find approximate solutions to things like NP problems with some degree of success. So, so it isn't the case. And in fact, in, in Wolfram Language and Mathematica, there are many things that we do where in principle, the problem is NP complete, but in practice, we can solve it uh, for all practical purposes really quickly. Um, uh, for example, the traveling salesman problem, the problem if you've got a bunch of cities in different places and so on, and you're asked, What's a route that visits those cities and the order so that the total distance that you will have to go in visiting all those cities is the smallest? So that is an MP complete problem. But in fact, in Wolfram language, we have a, a function called find shortest tour of up to thousands of, of cities. It will do a very good job of getting you, uh, if not the absolutely best, a uh, very close to the best um, routing around those cities. Okay. so. You know, what's happened with computational complexity theory? Well, so the P versus NP problem has been a still an outstanding problem. You know, when Arthur Jaffe made up these clay millennial problems a few years ago, uh, somebody put a, you know, put a million dollar bounty on this P versus NP problem. Um, it sort of got cast into a slightly different light when uh, um, uh, Peter Shaw, um, uh, realized that quantum Turing machines, as opposed to ordinary Turing machines, quantum Turing machines that sort of are models of, of quantum mechanics could solve the factoring problem in something that seemed like polynomial time. The end of that story is not completely told and our physics project kind of shows that there are some issues with that and there are issues about how the effectively the quantum measurement process works, all kinds of things like that. But that was an excitement of the 19... 90s, was it, um, that sort of uh, helped launch the whole quantum computing idea. Uh, well, it had been launched back in the 1980s and things, um, but to sort of helped get, get energy behind it was this idea, well, maybe we'll be able to do factoring uh, in, in polynomial time on a quantum computer. Now, this is all a bit tricky because factoring is not known to be an NP-complete problem. It is known to be an NP hard problem, which is it's in the class NP and it's it has various characteristics, but it's not a problem where it's known that, oh, we solved this, we've broken all the other NP complete problems. And it's not completely clear what the whole story of quantum computers is for that anyway, but that's a place where there's a whole nother raft of kind of work in quantum complexity, the computational complexity theory that ask for a quantum Turing machine as opposed to a Turing machine or a non-deterministic Turing machine, how fast can you do these computations? Well, my own feeling is this question, P versus NP, you know, are NP problems doable in polynomial time? It's actually a pretty difficult question to not even to define. It might seem like an obvious question, but let's say that you have a specific algorithm specific Turing machine, specific program, whatever. And you say, here's my program for solving this particular problem, okay? You could imagine enumerating all possible programs and just asking, what's the best one for solving this size N instance of the satisfiability problem? Okay, we get the answer. Uh, we know it's this particular program. Then we go to the next size. We say, what's the very best program for solving this satisfiability problem of this size, probably it's a different program. So what you have to ask is, it becomes a pretty difficult thing that's sort of a mixture of enumerating possible programs and looking at their, their running times um, as a function of size, and then you have to start enumerating all possible problem instances and so on. So a question is, as you look at that in the infinite limit and you say, which is gonna win? 
my collection of programs that I've been enumerating or the polynomial, the sort of the line that says this is the limit of polynomial time or, or something else. And that question of who's going to win is a very complicated question that is not just difficult in terms of the mathematics of, of setting up possible programs and analyzing them and so on. It's even difficult to define what you mean because it can wiggle around a lot. And it, my own suspicion is that the P versus MP problem, as it is, you know, it, it seems like an obvious definition, but it's not really quite as obvious. And it's not obvious that there will be an answer. So, so given a particular axiom system, that you're operating within, you can say, can that axiom system answer the question of what happens in the end, for infinite n, what happens? And the problem is, it's like many of these kinds of things, there are, there are questions about, does this sequence ever terminate? Well, it may be the case that there is an axiom system, like the axioms of arithmetic, the piano axioms, or the axioms of set theory, CFC axioms, whatever, those axioms just aren't powerful enough to answer that question. There, in some sense, is an answer. Well, uh, it's hard to say. Is there an answer? It's, it's, um, uh, you know, there's no upper bound on how long it may take you to answer that question. And the question would be: Is there, with a finite set of axioms, can you say, "I'm just going to grab the answer"? It, it may be arbitrarily far out. It may take me an arbitrarily long time in general. But I'm going to use these axioms to just sort of jump ahead and grab the answer. Well, it may be, which is what you're trying to do when you're saying, I'm going to solve the P versus MP problem. You're saying, I'm going to take the piano axioms and I'm going to say, slam dunk, I've, I've solved the P versus MP problem. As opposed to, I have to keep going. I have to look at more cases. I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to do the other thing. I, I can't figure it out finitely. Or is it the case that I can sort of finitely go and just take the, the axioms of set theory or something, just say, okay, I got the answer. My guess is it's going to be independent of some of these axiom systems. I don't know whether it'll be independent of set theory. Um, it it uh, I would be quite likely it's independent of pianoist axioms. And, and those different axiom systems, they involve different kinds of induction, different kinds of mathematical induction that they support, things like that. So that's a that's sort of a that's that's the but but people are mostly mostly people think the P versus MP problem is just kind of too hard and they're looking at it. I think there are ways into it using essentially empirical computational complexity theory. I've done some of this. Um, I will say that I think in general, in the understanding of P versus MP and so on, and let me not talk about this in detail here, I think that some of the things that we've understood from our physics project, particularly about these things called Ruleal multiway systems, uh, basically speak to many of these issues about P versus MP and so on. And I think there is a way of geometrizing essentially computational space that in the end is going to turn out to tell one a whole lot about these computational complexity kinds of questions. Basically, the issue is you've got all these different programs. Okay, so let's say you have numbers, you know, one, 1.1, 1, 1, 1 point, whatever. Numbers, very easy to arrange them on a line. It's very easy to give geometry to numbers. You can just sort of say how they, how they arrange themselves. Um, in the case of programs, it's much less clear how that works. You've got this program, it does this. You've got that program, it does that. How do those programs, how do you arrange those programs in some sort of geometrical space? Well, that's something that I think we're understanding on the basis of, um, of um, physics models and also on the basis of, of things that come from ideas from higher category theory and so on. I think we're understanding the answer to that. And that geometrization of computational complexity theory, I think is gonna to lead to some really interesting results. But this is, a, this is a, a, about history that's about the future. So I've, I've tried to give you a summary, a little bit of the history of computational complexity theory. And um, uh, it's been very difficult. You know, computational complexity theory, uh, the, one of the biggest challenges is to find a lower bound on a computation, to say this computation can never be done faster than this. For example, when it comes to multiplying numbers, you'll never be able to do it faster than a time of order n, because that's the time it takes to just read the digits in the number. You'd never know what the answer was without at least reading all the digits. But there are very few lower bounds that have been found on on different on computations. There are a few found with Boolean algebra, um, but that's that's the sort of holy grail of computational complexity theory is to prove lower bounds on how difficult it is to do a computation. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, well, let me take just a couple more things here. Um, 
there's a question here. I don't know all the details of this. There's a question here from Brian. Has the Voynich manuscript ever been decoded? Um, you know, there was a big tradition, I think in the 1600s uh, particularly, of writing these kind of obscure ciphers, writing books in some kind of obscure cipher that only, only some particular group would understand. And sometimes people wondered, you know, maybe some of these books were just nonsense. They were just generated by coin flipping and there was nothing, you know, you could try and figure them out, but you'd never figure them out. I mean, it's been sort of a tradition for a long time of people, you know, the puzzle being set up, but that was a particular thing, particular period of time. And um, the, uh, um, the thing that, um, uh, was that there are these kind of uh, these kind of cases where where people have um, have written these encoded documents and the question is do they mean anything do they mean nothing how would you decode them if they meant something it's sort of an interesting thing that's kind of like extraterrestrial intelligence or like archaeology it's like you've got this thing what does it mean does it mean anything you know you've got these marks on a stone do they mean something or are they somebody just playing around and testing out their chisel? Or what, what, what was going on here? Um, it's very hard to answer in general. Um, I think what tends to happen in, in the decoding of things, whether it's some um, uh, you know, hieroglyphics, linear B, whatever, whatever, all these different kinds of things, um, you know, what tends to happen is that there's a, a sequence of stepping stones that uh, you, know, you have to find a sort of Rosetta stone that connects these two languages, or you have to find a way in which you can find something which is close to that language and then get to this one and so on. There was a thing that was done recently. There was some, some nasty um, uh, a set of crimes in California, I guess, that, uh, the, the, that went under the, the heading of the Zodiac Killer, who had, I think, sent to some newspapers these kind of encoded messages. Um, and for many years, maybe close to 50 years, perhaps, um, these messages have been undecoded. And just in the last few months, uh, a chap called Sam Blake, former employee of ours, actually, um, and I think some other people also, was successful in, in using Orphan Language and Mathematica to, uh, to decode those algorithms, to, to decode those messages and find out the um, uh, rather, rather chilling, actually, uh, final sort of messages from, from this particular... Uh, serial murderer um, uh, about that that um, that this person had sent in. Finally, it was possible to decode those, but it took a long time to. Um, uh, and there was sort of a, a bunch of new ideas about how to kind of decode a certain kind of uh, kind of cipher. And and as I say, it's it's hard to know if there is a decoding, um, and you just haven't been sort of smart enough to figure out what it is, or if there really isn't a decoding, and the thing is what one might call a fake. It's just found by, by coin flipping, for example. All right, let's see. Um, oh my gosh. Um, Well, there's some questions here about Piva Sempi. Um, does a proof not exist to show that NP cannot be done in P? Is that the way to solve the Piva Sempi problem, assuming P is a subset of NP? Well, the issue is if the set of polynomial, the set of polynomial time problems is obviously a subset of the set of non-deterministic polynomial time problems. The question is, is it a proper subset in the sense that there exist things in NP that are not in P? That is, problems that are, that are doable as a non-deterministic polynomial time computation, but not doable as a polynomial time computation. That's the key issue, whether, whether P is equal to NP or whether there are pieces of NP that are missing from P. It's, it's certainly known that P is that, there, that anything that's in NP is certainly also in P. Um, there's a question here from 
die, I guess, could a computer randomly generate and test all algorithms from a, a graph of all possibilities? Um, yeah, so, so I mean, the question of can you find an algorithm that is a polynomial time algorithm, that is, okay, let me give you an example. The sorting problem. So you've got these n things and you've got to compare them and you're doing binary comparisons. And you're asking how many binary comparisons do you have to do to sort n things? Okay, so for a particular value of n, like 10, is it known for 10? Yes, it's known for 10. Um, it's known what the fastest algorithm, the smallest number of, of comparisons that have to be done is and in what order they have to be done. So it's an interesting fact that as you just try to enumerate all possible algorithms for doing that, the one that's the winner is one that looks quite complicated and it's known up to size maybe 14 or something. I don't know, there's, there's a bunch of pictures of this in the NKS book, I, I'd have to look it up. Um, but you know, one's just trying different algorithms and one's saying, is there a faster algorithm? You know, what's the fastest? You just enumerate all the possible sorting algorithms. You just say, what's the fastest algorithm to sort 11 things into order? And, but there's no regularity. It's not like the thing that's the fastest for 11 things immediately gives you a way to get the fastest for 12 things. Each one of those is a sort of custom fastest for a particular value of n. And so one of the challenges in the p versus mp question is how do you get the sort of flight of results which will be valid for all n? That's one of the, one of the comp complicated issues to figure out, and people haven't done much of this empirical computational complexity theory, where you're just saying, what is the fastest thing that you can get for, for a particular size? I mean, I looked at this in the case of combinators, I looked at it recently, um, at what the shortest combinator that generates particular things is for, for a succession of sizes. And that gives you sort of an empirical version of computational complexity theory and potentially gives you intuition about how the general problem of, of infinite size works. Um, all right, maybe one or two others here. Um, Okay, so question from GSEP about VR, virtual reality. Well, this is gonna be a combination of history and the future, I suppose, to talk about this. So what is virtual reality? Virtual reality is the ability to have a sort of a, a perception of the world that seems close to reality in the sense that, and so what this actually turns into is you wear these goggles and they give you a 3D, kind of perception of the world. And as you turn your head, there are, there are accelerometers and the goggles. And they, you know, as you normally, if I turn my head, I'll see different things. And when you're looking through these VR goggles, as you turn your head, they'll show you different stuff, just like, just as if you were there, so to speak. Well, sort of in the, in the, in the big sort of arc of history, there's kind of, when did things get to the point where it's as good as if you were there? Audio, got to that point by the 1990s, basically. You know, you can put little, you know, things things in your ears and the, the you know, with 44 kilohertz of sampling of sounds, you are, you are at the point where it's, it's sort of as good as it would be if you were in that concert hall, more or less. You're, the thing that is getting into your sensory system is just the same as it would be in the concert hall, so to speak. For vision, that hasn't yet happened. It's getting closer and virtual reality is part of the story of making that happen. We have a lot more nerve fibers going through our optic nerves than going, we have maybe 10 million in our optic nerve, maybe 50,000 in our auditory nerve. So it's sort of not surprising, it's more complicated, more data that's involved in getting it to, sort of getting us to have as if you were there visual experiences than as if you were there audio experiences. But it's gradually been working to be, to be closer to that. And um, the, you know, historically what happened is that well, back around the late 1980s, there was a big sort of uh, um, big sort of puff of interest in virtual reality, and I remember being at the SIGGRAPH conference, must have been 1989 or so, and there was sort of a lot of excitement for virtual reality. And it's like, try this on. You can, you know, you can play tennis in virtual reality. And the use cases in those days were things like playing tennis in virtual reality, architectural walkthroughs. Somebody's going to build a big building and they're going to spend millions of dollars on it. And it's like, what's it going to be like to be in this space? 
well, let's build a 3D model and let's experience it in virtual reality. Then um, uh, what was the other case? The other, another case was um, uh, molecular modeling. It was a time when rational drug design was big and people were saying, let's try and visualize this molecule in 3D and you can kind of use it with your hands to kind of, uh, you know, one of the issues that's sort of not really virtual reality, but it's a related thing, is when you're making a 3D object, it's really a big, big pain to actually construct 3D things. And so one thing that people have long wanted is a kind of clay-like experience. Everyone's getting closer to this. We can just use your fingers to kind of mold a 3D object rather than having to say, oh, you know, align this plane here and you turn things around, you put this other surface there and so on. It's all very, very awkward and very sort of sequentialized. Being able to do it in this kind of uh, a uh, moldable way is, is something which is not quite the virtual reality story, but is sort of related. But anyway, so there was this sort of puff of interest in um, in the late 1980s. And uh, there had been, there was a chap called Jaron Lanier who was very involved in, in creating the, the early virtual reality systems, kind of came out of, um, uh, well, his uh, he had this glove that had a very, very bizarre origin, um, but uh, that was... Um, uh, for sort of sensing, um, uh, sensing, sensing, um, uh, sort of finger positions and things, and um, then um, uh, there were um, um, kind of um, uh, you know that sort of went along with the the as if reality, you know, the the, the headdress and all that kind of stuff. So, so for a long time, things really. Okay, so so like at my company, we started developing things for VR back in the in the um, uh, in the early 1990s, and um, uh, well, it, it all didn't it all kind of petered out. It didn't really work out. It wasn't really a thing. It wasn't the systems weren't good enough. You know, even now, I I tend to get motion sick when I use a VR system because somehow the the you know the the things in my ears that sense acceleration and orientation for me don't quite align with the things I'm seeing in my eyes and and so on and so on and so on. It, it's getting progressively better, but um, we're not quite there yet. Um, but uh, but and we definitely weren't there in the in the um, at the beginning of the 1990s. So I think uh, uh, the the other thing that happened sort of historically. So so that then. Then the big thing that happened, I don't know, was was five years ago, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, there was this. One of the challenges in VR is just as you're looking through these screens, you have little little monitors, you know, near your eyes, and you know, it's a head-mounted display. That was kind of the big big thing about um, back in the in the late 1980s, the notion of head-mounted displays, and that had been a thing that was was done a bunch of military applications for that, and so on. But but so. The the um the the kind of uh, uh, this notion of the the head mounted display um, where you know you turn your head and it shows you different things and so on um, that um, well let's see so so uh, that had had well the, the one of the issues is when you have that head mounted display how accurate is this kind of visual scene that you see and one of the issues is if all you see are these little monitors that just uh, you know, go to a certain angle around your eyes, it isn't very realistic. Because it's like, well, I can see the edge of the monitor. That's not real life. Because in reality, we have pretty decent peripheral vision. You know, I'm, I'm waving my hand off here, and you know, I can still sense that there's something waving there, even though that's, that's, uh, you know, that's a long way away from the direction of my eye. Um, and you know, we have our retinas have, have um, uh, you know, a bunch of, of cells on them go round to a pretty large angle. So one of the one of the innovations that, uh, for example, Oculus um, was uh, was into was making a fairly cheap, well sort of set up displays that had a large opening angle. Um, so that was that was one of the other that was one of the things. I think it was about five years ago now. Um, sort of a, a burst of interest around um, Oculus and, and other and other things. Uh, sort of another issue for virtual reality is okay. So that was that was one thing was the virtual reality story. The other story was the augmented reality story, which is you put something in front of your visual scene where you're seeing the ordinary visual scene, but you're annotating it somehow. And then the question was, can you mount? Can you have a reasonable head-mounted thing that is uh, able to give you 
a, um, a good perception of something in your visual field. And you could either have that as something in your glasses, you can have a laser that's, that's sort of, you know, painting things on the back of your eye. There are a bunch of different schemes for doing that. And there's been a certain degree of enthusiasm for that. The Google Glass project was a, was a big sort of puff of enthusiasm for that, where the idea was, you know, you, I mean, I have some of these things, you, you have this little, you have this thing where there's a, a, a sort of a, a, a piece of glass where there's sort of a projector that's projecting uh, light into that piece of glass, which is then uh, with total internal reflection is, is, is sending it back to your eye. And that's, so it's superimposing this kind of data in front of your visual field. And um, the, uh, I think the thing that, uh, and that was, when was that? When was Google Glass? I don't know, I'm, I'm losing track of time. Five years ago, maybe? Uh, some, no, it was, it was longer ago than that. It was, um, it must have been nearly 10 years ago, nine years ago, because I remember, uh, I remember I was thinking about, for quite other reasons, I was thinking about the problem of the algorithmic problem of annotating visual scenes. Like if you're going to put labels on the visual scene that I'm looking at right now, where do I put the labels? Because I don't want to put them right in, on top of somebody's face. I want to put them out of the way. You have to have some kind of saliency filter that figures out where are the uninteresting parts of the image. So that's where you get to put the labels and so on. It'll be a, um, okay. So then anyway, there was sort of an enthusiasm for, for augmented reality um, around Google Glass. That must have been, as I say, close to 10 years ago now. Um, as is always the case in the world of technology, these things eventually come back. It's kind of like the fax machine it was invented a hundred years before you know it became popular, and, and you know it gradually things come back. So uh, one of the things that sort of held up, I think, you know, one of the issues is you've got a VR system, and what's the operating system? What's the you know we've got one of the reasons that bitmap displays and terminals and so on became pretty common is you know operating systems know how to deal with them. Um, the question of, of what to do with virtual reality and how to represent that visual scene and the interactions with it. And for example, things like Unity, I guess Unreal Engine, things like this, um, these, these systems for, uh, that are essentially game engines, um, these are the things that have become sort of de facto standard for representing geometry in a way that can be used for virtual reality. But it's a very bizarre sort of heavyweight mechanism because they are representing both the geometry and all the sort of game actions that can be done with that geometry. You really only need to represent the geometry, but there hasn't been a very clear standard that's emerged for how to do that. So, you know, it's a bit unclear what's going to happen. I mean, for example, you know, it's funny when I was first starting to think about these kind of discrete models of space time back in the early 1990s, that was at a time when virtual reality was big. And I kind of imagined that I would have these giant networks and I would be able to be inside the cobweb, so to speak, and use my fingers to kind of move the cobweb around and um, get it to the point where I could sort of visualize what was happening in this kind of giant evolving network. Okay, so we're now in 2021, we're now 30 years later. And um, uh, yes, I'm, I'm thinking about that again. You know, a year or so ago, I had made a few of these uh, complicated networks in, in virtual reality and tried to understand them in virtual reality. I have to say it was kind of a funny thing because it's like, I don't expect in my line of work that computer experimentation has sort of occupational hazard type, type things associated with it. But I was finding that I was trying to use this and I was finding that I go into VR, I visualize some of these universes and pretty soon I get motion sick. And it's kind of like, I can only do it for a small number of minutes before I, you know, before I get motion sick and can't, can't, can't do this anymore. Um, one of my kids actually gave me some, one of these many motion uh, uh, sickness, uh, uh, strange sort of acupunctural uh, kind of uh, uh, avoid motion sickness things uh, to, to help my kind of occupational hazard of, um, uh, of, of living in virtual reality to do, do doing science in virtual reality. It's very exotic. You know, it's, it's somehow, one doesn't expect to sort of put on gear to be going to investigate the fundamental theory of physics, at least not in the theoretical point of view. Um, but in any case, so that wasn't a great success. Now we're, we're trying again to do something where we have a big GPU based system using this Vulcan language um, to, uh, uh, to sort of do the hypergraph evolution and to be able to sort of present that in, in VR, we'll see how that works.
I think the big issue with AR, augmented reality, and sometimes people talk about XR, the kind of combination VR, AR uh, thing, AR, I think, has the potential to be pretty interesting. You know, if, if I'm going around and not that I've done that for the last year, but um, sort of out and about in the world and you're meeting groups of people and it's like, OK, let's annotate this person. You know, when you're in Zoom, it's very easy to annotate who is that person. You just hover over them and it gives the name. But um, in, in real life, we're not used to being able to sort of... Uh, uh, just sort of look at that person and immediately a little bubble comes up that says who that person is and, you know, tells you what all the email transactions you've had with that person in the last 20 years are or whatever else it is. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, that's something that augmented reality potentially can bring. The difficulty is how do you make glasses that are, uh, you know, how do you make something lightweight enough that people can really wear on their heads? How do you make it so you don't have a giant sort of a computer in your back pocket, so to speak. You know, I've, I've used a few of these systems um, that uh, are, are very promising in terms of the, the optics of how they deliver the images, but they're just like, you've got to wear this giant thing on your head, or you've got to strap to your, you know, uh, to, to yourself this, this big, um, you know, powerful computer and so on. So, th so these, are, these are practical problems. I mean, the, the rumor is that Apple is working on sort of an AR uh, system um, and uh, perhaps they'll manage to come up with something that is as sort of impressive as the AirPods or something in terms of just a sort of a form factor of how to deliver it. Once it's delivered and once it really becomes a thing, I, I, I suspect there'll be all kinds of things. I mean, there'll, there'll be a question of whether there's a camera also able to look at the scene that you're seeing. Because if there is, and you can then do uh, kind of analysis of the scene, there's all kinds of things you can do. You know, you can do things like visual diffs, I'm walking into this room again. What's changed here? Oh, my AR system will annotate that for me. I mean, the case of being out and about and sort of recognize a face, well, who knows whether uh, that will be, you know, what, what the future of sort of face recognition is going to be. But assuming you could do that, you could, um, and, and maybe the answer is you're not actually recognizing the face. It's just some kind of Bluetooth communication with the person's phone. And it knows, oh, that's the person there. But then it's annotating in your visual field. It's saying, that's so-and-so. And, oh, you guys are both interested in this. You should talk about that. Um, there are also many kinds of things like material identification or things like infrared, where you say, that thing is really hot. Don't touch it. And you can tell that by the fact that you can see it's infrared emission, but you couldn't see that by just looking at it visually, but your AR system can tag it for that. And there's a whole list of these things. I realize it's now nearly 10 years ago, but I, I made this big list of AR applications and I was trying to figure out sort of how, how one would actually deploy those things in Wolfram Language. And we came up with a lot of very interesting things and did absolutely nothing with them because the hardware just didn't, didn't make it. Um, and... Uh, so that 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 that's what happened to that. Um, okay, Brian is saying a cool VR site would be a digital louvre where you enter and walk around looking at NFTs and other types of exhibits. That is actually an interesting idea. So so I just went to a um, on uh, when was it Friday night or something? I went to a a virtual gallery opening in virtual reality of a gallery opening of AI artists. So it's, um, so in other words, this is something this was using the high fidelity platform for um, virtual gatherings. Um, and it wasn't, uh, wasn't a full, uh, you know, head mounted display experience, um, just a, a, a sort of an audio, 3D audio experience plus video. Um, of wandering around, chatting with people, looking at artworks produced by, by AI artists using, uh, um, I guess, GAN type technology with uh, artist statements generated by GPT-3 with um, uh, um, just pure synthesized text and so on. Uh, but there were real humans there, which was fun. But um, yeah, so, so, but this idea, oh, and by the way, of course, every piece of art that was there was, uh, some of it was already in NFTs and some of it was about to be auctioned as NFTs and so on. Um, and um, uh, for, for those who don't know, NFTs are non-fungible tokens. It's kind of the idea on a blockchain, most popularly Ethereum right now, but Tezos and, and other blockchains are, are getting these too. Um, 
the idea is to have this token that says, I own this thing, just like in a, in a you know, a title deeds of a house, there's a thing that says, you know, I own this house and it's stored at the title registry. So here on the Ethereum blockchain is something for all to see saying, this, this address owns this particular token. And there's this ERC-20 token protocol that, well, that this, um, that this is a, a type of computational contract that basically says only one person can own this token. So if I own this NFT, the only way you get to own this NFT is if I transfer this NFT to you. You can't clone the NFT because there's a unique copy of it um, on, this, uh, on this blockchain. So, so the, one of the coming attractions in the world of, of, uh, of art is let's make that into an NFT. And yeah, we're, we're doing some of these things too, although I really want trying to figure out a really clever thing to do with NFTs, which we may or may not succeed in, in finding. Um, but uh, and it's unclear whether NFTs are relevant to things like software licensing, all kinds of interesting things like that. Um, but uh, uh, yes, the, the notion of you can go around and, um, I mean, it's a very bizarre thing. At the Louvre, you know, you could, um, uh, you too could own an NFT for the Mona Lisa, but presumably you're not the sole owner of the NFT for the Mona Lisa because there has to be this connection between the physicality of the Mona Lisa and the number of NFTs that have been created for it. And it's kind of like the, the, the concept of, you know, when you have a, a limited edition porcelain pig or something, um, you know, at some point, it's a limited edition because the mold was broken and there are no more, uh, you know, no more, well, no more coins or whatever in some mint. No more coins are going to be produced of that exact kind because the mold was broken. And so, you know, there are only that number of coins in circulation. In the physical world, those coins are not clonable, at least not without, you know, more elaborate 3D scanner, 3D printer type technology. All right. I think I need to wrap up here. Um, and... Uh, Lots of interesting questions for another time. And uh, we've explored a variety of different, um, uh, different kinds of things. Um, and uh, yeah, very interesting stuff. Um, actually, for those interested, I'm doing a, a live stream associated with my day job in just a few minutes about uh, language design for from language. But I um, uh, have to go from here now. So uh, thanks for joining us and uh, come back another time and 